Whether you put a piece of your paycheck into a retirement account every month, or you actively pick your own stocks, you should know that Nvidia sits near the top of the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. So knowing what they're up to can give you a huge leg up as an investor. Well, Nvidia stock has collapsed by more than 40% over the last year, making now a great time to decide if it's a good investment. So in this episode, I want to answer a few simple questions. Is Nvidia mostly just a gaming company that sells expensive graphics cards? Did Nvidia stock just go up because of the pandemic? And since interest in gaming, cryptocurrencies, and the metaverse have all virtually vanished, is Nvidia's future in serious trouble? Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. If you don't know much about Nvidia, a good place to start is understanding why graphics cards are so important to so many different industries besides video games. While video cards have been around since the 1980s, things really changed in 1999 when Nvidia released the GeForce 256. This was the first full-fledged graphics processing unit or GPU. Before Nvidia, computers relied on central processing units or CPUs to perform the complex but repetitive calculations involved in generating graphics. Think about transforming the scene as a viewer moves through it, or handling surface and lighting effects and so on. This was slow because CPUs process only one or two instructions at a time, but GPUs are designed to handle many similar tasks in parallel, making them great for rendering graphics. The GeForce 256 even incorporated a transform and lighting engine directly onto the chip itself, which resulted resulted in a huge performance boost over previous kinds of cards. The GeForce 256 put Nvidia on the map, and they've been innovating in the graphics space ever since. Today, Nvidia owns over 85% of the GPU market. But while most people still associate GPUs mainly with gaming, they're used for much more than that. From architecture and product design, to artificial intelligence and machine learning, these graphics chips power the applications behind our daily lives. In fact, the reason you're watching this video right now is because of YouTube's video recommendation algorithm, which runs on thousands and thousands of GPUs. But everything changed in the beginning of 2020. Nvidia's GPU sales exploded thanks to shutdowns and stimulus checks. Stuck at home with nowhere to go, gamers and professionals alike were eager to upgrade their machines as more of everyone's time moved online. At the same time, when the lockdowns first started, they halted everything from production lines to delivery services. And of all of the industries hit by these supply chain issues, computer chips were hit the hardest. That year, the auto industry alone lost over $100 billion because they couldn't get enough chips to put inside their cars. The second issue for GPUs was that crypto miners found that graphics cards were great for mining Ethereum, which was rocketing up in price. Ethereum is the most popular blockchain for NFTs and the home to some of the biggest metaverse projects on the planet, both of which got a lot of hype during the pandemic. As a result, Ethereum saw massive growth from a high of $730 in 2020 to a whopping $4,800 in 2021. So demand skyrocketed as gamers, professionals, and crypto miners all scrambled to buy new GPUs. Lower supply plus higher demand means massive price inflation for Nvidia's cards. And as a result, Nvidia's revenue from their gaming segment, which is the one that covers all of their consumer GPU sales, shot up to over $3 billion in a single quarter. That was an 85% increase from just one year before. But in 2022, all those massive tailwinds turned into headwinds. For example, as the lockdowns ended, people spent far less time in front of their screens at home. Also, more apps, services, and workloads moved onto the cloud, which means they can be accessed by mobile devices and laptops instead of needing a beefy desktop computer. On top of that, almost all the demand for Ethereum mining dried up completely. Not just because Ethereum's price crashed by over 70%, which makes it far less profitable to mine, but also because Ethereum changed how it got mined altogether back in September of last year, and GPUs are no longer the best solution. As a result, Nvidia's gaming division reported just $1.57 billion in revenue in the third quarter of 2022. That's half of what it was at its peak. We'll see if things get better or worse for Nvidia's gaming division when they report their final numbers for 2022 at their next earnings call, which is in just a few weeks. Either way, that's the context for why gaming, which was once Nvidia's top earning business unit, is seeing historically low numbers today. Now with that context out of the way, let's start answering some of those questions from the start of the episode. A few months ago, Nvidia launched their RTX 40 series of graphics cards. Nvidia's chips are built by TSMC, but Nvidia doesn't just order chips from TSMC like we do from Uber Eats. Instead, the two companies work together to create a special version of TSMC's 
4 nanometer chip fabrication process that's optimized specifically for GPUs. That process lets TSMC pack a whopping 76 billion transistors and over 18,000 cores onto Nvidia's chips, which is about 70% more than their previous generation, which was their RTX 30 series graphics cards. Nvidia's management was pretty optimistic about the future of GPUs during their latest earnings call. Their CFO said that retailers were sold out of the RTX 4090 within minutes, even with that hefty $1,600 price tag. When the RTX 40 series cards first came out, I made a video saying that I think they're overpriced, especially given the amazing performance of the 30 series cards and the performance per dollar of competing GPUs from AMD. I actually still stand by that opinion, but you should take it with a grain of salt because Nvidia's sales numbers don't lie. They shipped over 150,000 units in the first two weeks alone. As a result, Nvidia's CFO thinks that the third quarter of 2022, which is their latest quarter of financial results at the time of this recording, marked a bottom for Nvidia's gaming segment. And they expect the segment to start growing again in quarter four and well into 2023. Stacy Raskin, who is the senior semiconductor analyst at Bernstein Research, is also optimistic about Nvidia's gaming segment. Here's what he had to say to CNBC about Nvidia's most recent numbers. Okay, is it is it possible for you to say right in, in the here and now that the worst is in, that the worst is behind this company? I, I don't know yet. I, I mean, it does seem like hopefully numbers have hit a bottom. Like I said, the gaming numbers are pretty good. I think one of the big questions into the guide next quarter is going to be the sequentials by by business line. Um, the guide for the total revenues were kind of flattish into Q4. So the big question is like, is anything growing? Is gaming growing? Is data center growing? Like all else being equal, I think you'd rather have data center grow sequentially into Q4 versus gaming. So that'll be one of the key questions on the call, I think. Yeah, and we- But we overall, the, num the numbers relative to expectations look okay. Yeah. So after the perfect storm of shutdowns ending, people spending more time on mobile devices and demand for Ethereum miners going to zero, it looks like Nvidia's GPU revenue could have found its bottom. But that begs the question, should investors only focus on gaming? What about Nvidia's other business units? In the third quarter of 2022, Nvidia's data center business brought in $3.26 billion in revenue. That's double the revenue of their gaming segment and a massive 71% increase from the previous year. This is why I spent some time covering the differences between CPUs and GPUs. It turns out that GPUs are great for machine learning. Even though that doesn't sound anything like rendering graphics, both kinds of workloads take in large amounts of data and solve similar types of math problems in parallel. Nvidia Nvidia has a few different data center chips that are all worth talking about. Let's start with their A100 Tensor Core GPUs. These chips are specifically designed for data centers focused on machine learning, data analytics, and high performance computing, which is obviously a very hot market right now thanks to AI models like ChatGPT and Dolly 2. Nvidia's newer H100 data center chips are a massive step up from the A100s in terms of performance, promising up to a 9x speed up in AI training like the kinds used for self-driving cars. They also offer a whopping 30x speedup for inference models, like the massive natural language processing models behind GPT-3, which powers chat GPT, or the image processing models that generate and modify images for DALI-2. And then there's Grace. Grace is Nvidia's first data center CPU, and it goes on sale in the first half of this year. According to Nvidia, Grace can deliver 10 times the performance of today's fastest chips when it comes to high performance computing and AI workloads. One thing that's always impressed me about Nvidia's designs is that they can connect together to form more powerful systems at virtually any scale. For example, eight of these H100 chips can be connected to form a DGX H100 server system. And if you combine nine of these DGX H100 server systems, you get a DGX pod, which is the reference design that can be scaled up to offer AI services at enterprise levels and beyond. But it doesn't stop there. You can connect 32 DGX pods together to create a super pod, which provides around one exaflop of computing performance. And Nvidia is linking 18 of these super pods together to build a supercomputer called EOS, which will be about four times faster than Fugaku in Japan which is currently the world's fastest supercomputer. But Nvidia doesn't just build supercomputers for themselves. Their hardware can actually be found in over 70% of the 500 most powerful supercomputers around the world. Supercomputers like Meta Platforms' Research Supercluster, or RSC, which is one of the largest customer installations of Nvidia's hardware. This supercomputer is connecting over 6,000 Nvidia GPUs to do things like translate speech between large groups of people, each speaking a different language. Nvidia also just announced that they'll be providing thousands of GPUs and accelerators to power Microsoft's 
advanced supercomputer infrastructure, which will provide scalable AI training and deployment to other businesses. So NVIDIA's GPUs are the platforms behind these platforms. NVIDIA announced a similar collaboration with Oracle and their cloud service, where their chips will power natural language processing engines behind chatbots and virtual AI assistants. And that's on top of their already long-standing partnership with Amazon Web Services, which utilizes NVIDIA's server GPUs for their virtual machines as well. NVIDIA dominates the data center market even more than the consumer one, with a whopping 90% market share for enterprise GPUs. In my opinion, as the world becomes more and more data-driven, demand for NVIDIA's data center hardware will keep climbing across nearly every industry. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows for NVIDIA's data center business. Several months ago, the US government ordered NVIDIA and AMD to stop selling AI chips and systems to China. NVIDIA said that this ban could cost them around $400 million worth of data center revenue per year, which is about 3 or 4% of their total. But just a few weeks ago, NVIDIA announced a chip called the A800 as an alternative product for consumers in China. NVIDIA designed this chip specifically to get around this ban. Most of the other specs of the chip are identical to the A100. But the big difference is that the interconnects in the A800 run at 400 gigabytes a second instead of 600 to get under the performance threshold set by this chip ban. So, between how small the impact of these bans are on NVIDIA's revenues, and how quickly they can change their chip designs to get around them, I'm not really too worried about how these trade wars affect NVIDIA's bottom line. But while NVIDIA is making big strides in data centers, and their gaming segment seems ready for a rebound, NVIDIA has another division that's growing even faster. Even though automotive is only bringing in around 4% of NVIDIA's overall revenue right now, it grew by 80% year over year. They have about $11 billion worth of automotive business in their pipeline over the next five years, and I expect that number to grow substantially as autonomous driving and in-car infotainment both become more mainstream. NVIDIA's automotive offerings can be broken out into two parts, hardware and software. NVIDIA's self-driving hardware platform is called Hyperion, and it supports a wide array of sensors. Hyperion 8 can achieve full self-driving with a 360-degree camera, radar, LiDAR, and ultrasonic sensor suite. Hyperion 8 will ship in Mercedes-Benz cars starting in 2024, followed by Jaguar Land Rover in 2025. This is how NVIDIA will provide self-driving as a platform. Mercedes-Benz, Jaguar Land Rover, and recently Lucid Motors announced their electric self-driving SUV called the Gravity, which will use NVIDIA's Hyperion system and connect to their drive software platform, which also has two parts. First, there's Drive Map, which is a crowdsourced real-time digital twin of every road that they get data for. Eventually, NVIDIA expects to map every major highway in North America, Western Europe, and Asia. That's hundreds of thousands of miles of physical roads that'll have digital twins. If NVIDIA knows where a car is in this digital twin, they'll also know where it is in real life. Then the Hyperion sensors in the car can double check what they're seeing against that digital twin. Then there's Drive Sim, which can take in recorded drive data, turn everything in the scene into an interactive object, and store those objects for further reuse. Drive Sim also lets NVIDIA change anything in the recording and rerun a bunch of simulations in that environment. Or they can change the environment altogether by adding different lighting effects and weather conditions and road hazards and so on. NVIDIA software can also simulate what different sensors would see in a given scenario. So for example, they can simulate a city street, show what a LiDAR would see on that city street, and then calculate the depth map that it would return. That means that they can train their self-driving AI on LiDAR data, even though they didn't collect it in a real city street. All this to say NVIDIA's automotive business is one of their most promising business units, even if it's the smallest one by revenue today. So whether you put a piece of your paycheck into a retirement account every month, or you actively pick your own stocks, you should know that NVIDIA sits near the top of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, and knowing what they're up to gives you a huge advantage as an investor. And now you know that they're much more than just a gaming company, that their hardware and software help power some of the biggest cloud services and supercomputers on the planet. They've built a suite of tools for self-driving vehicles that will hit the road as early as next year, and we haven't even scratched the surface on their other multi-billion dollar efforts like Earth 2, which is a digital twin of the entire world including its water and weather systems, or NVIDIA's Omniverse, which could end up powering a big chunk of the metaverse if it ever becomes a reality, or their cutting-edge work in robotics, the list goes on and on. But before you go investing your hard-earned money, there's another risk you really need to consider. And if you want to know what it is, check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. That lets me know to put out more research like this. 
Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.